Hi everyone, welcome to the final video, yes I've said final, of module 7 in ethics, analytics and the duty of care. Module 7 looked at the decisions we make in AI and analytics and this video will look at the final set of decisions, those that we make with and around the act of using artificial intelligence and analytics. Uh, it's worth pointing out, I think, that AI has already started to enter the mainstream. It's here now. It, it isn't this mysterious thing that might arrive someday in the future. We are working and living with it even now. Perhaps we might not realize that we're using it, but we are and it is beginning to have a significant impact on our lives. Let me just throw out a few quick examples of the sort of things that I personally am using AI for. Um, something called Feedly is an RSS aggregator and what that means is that it gathers contents from websites from around the internet. I tell it which websites I want it to harvest, it goes out and gets the contents for me. What Feedly does is it organizes the material that has been harvested based on rules, well, maybe not rules, based on artificial intelligence that I use to train, uh, that I use examples that I want to sort or categorize as examples to train it on. Boy, <laughs> when I do the transcript of that, I'll have to come up with that sentence a bit more uh, coherently. It's been a long day. It's been a long week and a long month and then these things are beginning to take a toll on me but I, I hope you see that we're getting close to the end of all of this. So what I found is that Feedly is a really good recommender and the reason why it's really good to my mind is because it's using the sources that I want it to use. So it's not picking, you know, some random marketing content from some uh, fly-by-night operation out there somewhere. And then it's using my training set in order to train the AI. I'm picking the kind of stuff that I want. It's not tracking me. It's not surveilling me. Um, you know, if I happen to look at something that's a little bit different, it's not going to alter the rest of my search results for all time. I feel really in control of my AI with Feedly. I think it's a pretty good example of the way AI should work in the future, the way analytics should work in the future. Another thing I use, and I've shown this before, is Google Recorder. I managed to find some white uh, background photos. Google loves the dark mode. Here it is right here. And I've done, I've shown this a bunch of times, but I can't ever get tired of showing Google Recorder creating a pretty good transcription live as I speak it. And uh, my intent for this entire set of uh, videos is to go back and use those transcriptions I'm going to edit them down, I'm going to make them better, and that will produce written versions of all of these contents. It's, I think it's any writer's dream to be able to write by thinking aloud rather than have to go through the laborious process of using a, a pen, which I still have, or using a keyboard, which again I still have. Another example something called Topaz AI. I won't fire it up here because it it probably won't bog down the machine, but I don't want to risk it because uh, then I'll just have to start the video over and I don't want to do that. But what Topaz does is it works either on its own or the way I use it is an editor integrated with Adobe Lightroom and I can use it to intelligently fix my photos. So uh, there's two that I use quite a bit. The first one, I've been using it for a while now, is called Denoise AI. And what happens when I take a picture at uh, too high an ISO, in other words, at too low light, 
Instead of nice smooth colors, I get pixelation. And Denoise removes the pixelation and replace it with, replaces it with a nice smooth col uh, color. Sharpen AI uh, does exactly what the name suggests. It uh, looks at various ways I could be producing bad photos. For example, by moving my camera or by being out of focus. Analyzes that, figures out what kind of fix it needs to apply, then applies the fix. And so that's how I'm able to get some nice sharp pictures of birds instead of the usual fuzzy pictures of birds. One of the questions I ask, and it's an important question, is have I preserved the integrity of the photo when I'm using AI to enhance the photo? And to me, the question boils down to, have I changed what I actually saw when I looked through the viewfinder to take the picture? If the answer is yes, then I've damaged the photo. I shouldn't be using the AI. But if the answer is no, if I'm removing artifacts that actually make the picture less faithful to what I saw, then I don't think that I'm violating any sort of principle of the photographer. And of course, other people just might not care. They're just after a better picture. Who cares if it's real? But I care. Um, another one I would not want to give up is adaptive cruise control in my car. This is actually what my car looks like. I, I drive a Honda Clarity with the, the weird thing on the rear wheel there. And uh, it's a, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. So uh, while everybody else is really worried about the gas, price of gas these days, I don't even notice the price of gas because I fill up so rarely. It can have a spike and drop and hit valleys and I would never know. What adaptive cruise control does is uh, it allows me, like normal cruise control, to set a speed that I want the car to go at. But it keeps an eye out in front of me and if somebody else is driving along at a slower speed than mine, it will slow down my car to match pace with the other car. So it adapts to whatever's happening in front of me. There's also a mechanism that will keep me between the lines. I don't like that one so much because it, it sort of wanders a bit. I want it to stay centered between the lines, not just between the lines. But overall, I mean, it makes driving a lot easier and a lot safer. And, a lot safer. So in addition to saving on gas, I'm also saving on insurance costs. How about that? So those are just some simple examples of how I'm using AI. But let's think now about how the use of artificial intelligence uh, affects the ethics of artificial intelligence. Let's begin by dispelling the common myth. And the common myth is that uh, our contribution to AI is as data to train the data models. Um, and that's unfortunate. Um, as this article in Tech Republic says, most analytics treat the data subject as passive, just a set of raw variables. But in fact, we as people who are involved in the process of AI may have something to say as well. And the question comes, what happens when we don't speak out? Um, I've got an image here um, from Privacy Watch uh, about Cambridge Analytica harvesting 50 million Facebook profiles. That's what happens when we don't speak out, right? So we are already, whether we like it or not, engaged in a conversation about the ethics of AI. We're not just going to be passive data subjects, we're going to be active contributors to that debate. So, who in that debate is speaking for us? Well, there's different ways of approaching this problem, right? You'd think, well, we're speaking for ourselves, but that never happens, it rarely happens. Uh, we don't live in a direct democracy where everybody contributes their own individual voice. Uh, our legislation is not created or approved by referendum. So for the most part in the political process, people are going to speak for us. They're going to speak for us at all of the different stages that we've covered of the creation 
testing, evaluation, and deployment of artificial intelligence. So let's look at a little bit of that. Probably the most common discussion of who speaks to who speaks for us is the discussion of diversity of voices in AI development teams. And there are different ways that this comes out. Josh Feast wrote a thing in Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago about uh, how to ensure diversity in AI development teams. And he says things like ensure diversity in the training samples, ensure that the people labeling audio samples or any samples come from diverse backgrounds, um, measure accuracy levels uh, differently or separately for each different demographic categories in order to ensure that they're accurate and reliable for each of those demographic categories. Collect more training data uh, associated with sensitive groups and apply modern machine learning debiasing techniques. Now we, we've talked a bit about that in the past. Uh, by itself, ensuring diversity in AI development teams is probably not going to be sufficient, but it may well be necessary. Um, we also need to have a diversity of perspectives. Um, here we're not just talking about the usual kinds of demographics, uh, demographics like you know race, religion, language, etc. Um, instead, as uh, John Haven says, um, you can't have a standard on facial recognition technology and not have in the room data scientists, psychologists, anthropologists and people from around the world. Now that might end up being a very big room, but nonetheless, I think the point here is valid. And the point here is that diversity in artificial intelligence isn't, isn't <coughs> excuse me, isn't just a technical problem. It isn't just a mathematical or statistical problem. Uh, it goes beyond that so that the, the sorts of things that aren't considered at the technical or mathematical level are considered in the development team. A simple example, um, people's faces were being used without their permission in order to power technology that, would, that could eventually be used to surveil them. That was reported by NBC News. And if we were simply relying on diversity as, you know, a technical or mathematical process, then there's no problem with that. And in fact, that's a good thing, right? We're going to get all these millions of scraped online photos and we'll get a really good diverse sample doing that, presumably. But someone in the room should have said something like, maybe you should ask them first or something like that, raising the question of whether it's appropriate to simply mine people's face data from the nearest handy social network service. Another way that people speak for us is in defining what counts as success. And this is something that I've talked about before, and I'm going to raise it here again. Um, for example, uh, look at the uh, World Bank's education programs. Key questions are, what counts as success for these programs, and importantly, success for whom? Quote, the teaching of life skills, the promotion of data capturing digital technologies, and the push to evaluate teachers' performance are all then closely linked to the agenda of the World Bank. That's Philip Kerr saying this in his blog. And that agenda consists of things like cost accounting and quantification, competition and market incentives, and the private sector in, involved in, role, in education and rolling back the role of the state. If the World Bank is the organization who is going to speak for us with respect to uh, the ethics of artificial intelligence, 
then this world view is going to inform what we think of as successful artificial intelligence. Question is, who made the World Bank our representative, right? Uh, when organizations like the World Bank weigh in on these sorts of questions, what we need to ask is what voices are being overlooked or even what voices are being silenced. Here, what other evaluations could we make of the World Bank's education programs? We could ask, for example, are people actually learning? Are they uh, acquiring skills that help them be more successful in life? Are they satisfied with the way that they are treated as citizens or as uh, you know, ethical beings? Uh, the ethical perspective, indeed, is something that does not sit well in the boardroom generally. And that again raises questions about who speaks for us. Uh, this is just a little story of Google and ethics here. Um, the uh, independent ethics board that it launched in 2019, it was forced to shut down less than two weeks later because of controversy about who was appointed to it. Then later on, um, after Google recruited a star ethics researcher, Timnit Gebru, uh, she was fired, that's her picture there, she was fired for criticizing Google's AI ethics. Um, and then they fired another ethics researcher following another internal investigation. If you're firing your ethics people, um, it's sort of like you saying, you don't want to hear what your conscience has to tell you. Um, and that's not a good look. And it raises the question in my mind, uh, on what authority does Google uh, assert frankly, anything to do with ethics and AI when it can't even get along with its own ethics advisors. Um, talking about the data analytics team as a whole, uh, there's a variety of roles that are played and a variety of individuals that need to make decisions about what happens. And we've seen a whole bunch of this so far, but let's look at the actual people who are making these decisions rather than the workflow process. And I'm borrowing from Radon here. Uh, the analytics team will need individuals to identify the business request, develop a use case, understand how data fits into that use case, create the algorithm and analyze the data, develop reports and dashboards, uh, develop a prototype for models and tools, pilot it, scale it, and then ensure that it's adopted and that there's ongoing maintenance of it. Uh, this could be represented as just three people, the data engineer, the data scientist, and the business stakeholder. But in practice, it's going to be a much larger team of people, especially if you're working in a large enterprise. All of these people are making ethical decisions, and they're making ethical decisions usually not based on the business needs. That's what the first person does, but the rest of them are making decisions based on something else. The question is, what sort of decisions are they making and what sort of ethics are coming into play. And that's going to vary in every application of uh, ethical decision making to a, an analytics or AI project. Let's look at a few of these roles in a little bit more detail. For example, consider the person that we call the data controller. Now this is a role that's actually sanctioned in law. Uh, it's identified, for example, in the uh, European uh, GDPR. And the main purpose of the data controller is to be someone who ensures that the use of personal data is fair and lawful. Well, mostly lawful. And so 
they would ensure things like making sure that data subjects are informed, kept up to date, understand what's happening. They make sure that the data is only used for the purposes uh, that uh, have been identified to the data subject. They make sure that the data itself is up to date, that it's accurate and that it's secure. And they make sure that any request that the data subject has about the handling of the data receives a response. None of this is technical. None of this has anything to do with the actual creation of the AI or the mathematics behind, say, bias and fair representation uh, of, a, of a data sample or, a, or an analytical process. But it's an important kind of role. It shows the way that humans set up the environment around which an AI project takes place. Um, another person, obviously, who's been in our mind for out for pretty much the entire course, is the AI researcher. And the question that can be asked is, who is actually doing the research in AI? Uh, this article points out that very few research articles on AI in education have been written by actual educators, with the majority of authors coming from computer science and science uh, and engineering backgrounds. And Melissa Bond, Melissa, Bond, Melissa Bond and Olaf Zawicki Richter write, this raises the question of how much reflection has occurred about appropriate pedagogical applications of AI. Again, this isn't a question of the engineering. It's not a technical kind of question. It's not a mathematical kind of question. It's the sort of question we ask about use and what is an appropriate use of AI. Uh, we could, for example, use an AI to have people uh, recite and memorize passages from a book. AI would actually be pretty good at that and could evaluate how well they've read back the passages that they've memorized. But that's not a pedagogically appropriate use. Even if it results in better grades, it's still not a pedagogically appropriate use because the, the education use case in, in this instance would be so narrowly focused on that one piece of content without any context surrounding that content that it would be pedagogically uh, inappropriate, not to mention useless. So these are the sorts of questions that need to be asked about the application of AI and the researcher in AI needs to be thinking about more than just, well, how do we sequence the data and present it to the user? Or how do we match the data to the preferences that we think the user has? Uh, education is more, as I've often said, than a search problem. And there's often a tendency on the part of AI researchers to reduce it to a search problem. Regulators, uh, again, these are not users of AI, properly so called, but they're certainly involved in the use of uh, artificial intelligence and in analytics. Uh, there's a uh, regular, regulatory framework for AI uh, that's been uh, proposed by the Government of Canada, the uh, Canadian Privacy Commission, um, and uh, it suggests that uh, an appropriate law would allow personal information to be used for new purposes, authorize those uses within a rights-based framework, create provisions specific to automated decision-making, and require businesses to demonstrate accountability, whatever that means. Uh, we've gone far enough through this course to know about the weaknesses of a rights-based framework uh, specifically, uh, we could say, for example, that there are many instances of what might be considered unethical uses of AI that are not covered by a rights-based framework because rights are focused on individuals and they're usually focused on specific aspects of individuals. 
and especially their freedom from discrimination, their freedom from restraint, uh, unfair punishment, etc., uh, and their freedom to express themselves. But a rights-based framework doesn't address social justice. Uh, a right, a rights-based framework doesn't address equality of opportunity, and it doesn't address society-wide concerns like the state of uh, accuracy in the media uh, and the role that fake uh, information plays or uh, the overall prevalence of a surveillance state where everybody's treated the same so they all have the same rights so everything's good but it's a surveillance state things like that we see it more in other areas like the environment where you can't really create a rights-based case for protecting the environment at least not without really stretching it a lot um, and by analogy, there are probably issues impacted by AI and analytics similar to environmental issues that are not addressed by a rights-based framework. Um, but the regulators, again, we, we need to ask, how do they come by the knowledge, the capacity, and the, uh, the right to make these decisions on our behalf. Um, they consider things like copyright, trade secrets, privacy laws, data governance, but we as educators are more concerned about uh, individual agency, personal prosperity, uh, community uh, relationships, things like that, that aren't covered under these kind of concerns that are typical of regulatory bodies. Another question that comes up, and I've mentioned this before, what, what, what data counts? Um, when we're inputting data into the system, uh, what data are we pulling out of the environment and what data are we ignoring? And are we focusing too much on one particular type of data? Simple example, uh, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, DORA, lovely name, um, is a call for the major players in academia and scholarly publishing not to use journal impact factors as a, quote, surrogate measure, unquote, of the quality of individual scientists or their work. Um, and that comes from a news article in Research Research. Um, and it's a good point. Um, the, the measure of the quality of an individual scientist's research is something that's determined by a wide variety of factors and, and probably uh, an indeterminate number of factors. Again, it's one of these 60,000 data point kind of things where uh, you might not know exactly how to identify a key or important researcher in the field, but you know it when you've seen one. And focusing on things like journal impact factors, which are in fact actually out of control of the researcher, um, seems to be an inappropriate way of assessing the researcher. But this is what often happens in evaluation and metric-based programs where the researchers key in on a few data points and use those, those data points to train their models or to draw whatever conclusions they're going to conclude. So the question comes up, uh, how do the rest of us have an impact, have a say in what data counts and what data doesn't count when we're talking about training AI algorithms and data models? Um, you know, and when you think about it, we can get out, outside or we can go beyond traditional categories when we're talking about this sort of thing. Example here, and you can see it on the slide, is citizen science. And this is a form of science, as Erwin describes in 1995, developed and enacted by citizens themselves. Um, and an important strand of citizen science is the contextual knowledges, and you notice how that's plural, 
that are generated outside of formal scientific institutions. This is a way for people, individual people, ordinary people, to become involved in the scientific process. Um, now, the classic case is, you know, the, the sort described by Mellon, where people are involved in sending out a bunch of sensors to be placed in homes in Madrid, Dublin, etc., other European capitals. That will count the number and speed of vehicles, cyclists, and pedestrians. Yeah, okay, citizens can place sensors. That doesn't seem like much. But where those sensors are placed, what information they're capturing, and the role of the citizens in deciding that this information is indeed worth capturing, and that we're going to measure, say, not only the flow of cars, but the flow of bicycles and pedestrians, that's what's important here. And so it's this interaction between the scientific community who wants to do this research and the citizen community who's a major part of designing and implementing this research that actually changes it. And you can see how this becomes a model for artificial intelligence research where, sure, you have the professionals who, who are building the AI, the algorithms, setting it up and training the modules or the models but you have citizens involved in discussing and actually contributing to the sort of information that will be fed to the models and the design of the models, figuring out what they will receive as data, how it will be labeled, how it will be organized, how it will be collected. This leads us to a concept of what might be called citizen inquiry. And uh, it, it comes, I guess, originally from Sharples. Although, you know, again, like these ideas, there's never one unique source for them. But the idea of citizen inquiry, and I quote, is that it fuses the creative knowledge building of inquiry learning with the mass collaborative participation exemplified by citizen science, changing the consumer relationship that most people have with research to one of active engagement. And so citizens, quoting again, are engaged in all aspects of a research project from defining the research questions to collecting, analyzing, reporting data. And you might say, well, they're totally unqualified to do this. And yeah, maybe they are on their own, not working in an inquiry project without any guidance from real life scientists and researchers. But if you have these people working together on a common project, then you are bringing in these multiple perspectives and multiple points of view into the creation of the inquiry itself. And so you're not just relying on what some bank or some government agency or whatever says is worth measuring or is worth counting. Uh, similarly, um, we could look at how the actual materials used or even created by an AI or analytic system are created. Um, here, looking at an article by uh, Rebecca Koenig in EdSurge, of all places, um, there is a lot of human intervention that happens behind the scene in chatbots. Now, the, the most basic kind of chatbots are rule-based chatbots. And in a rule-based chatbot, there's going to be a lot of scripting, a lot of scripting, because everything the chatbot says is going to have to be written ahead of time by an individual. Now, this is going to be less the case in a neural network or deep learning based chatbot, but it's still going to need to be provided with a vocabulary that it can that it can use. It's still going to need to be guided by the sorts of scenarios that might come up, the type of information that it might, might need to report on, even the kind of expressions it might use in a conversation with a person. So either way, 
you're going to need uh, an understanding of narrative convention. You're going to need to know, for example, uh, to, to train the chatbot, for example, to take turns speaking, to ask for feedback, etc. Uh, the chatbot is going to need to be able to interpret really what the nature of the request is. That's going to require quite a bit of human intervention. I think it's going to be a while before we have an AI that both manages to conduct a conversation and on the other hand has a depth of knowledge on the subject that is supposed to be helping someone with. We are moving in that direction but the only way we're actually going to be moving in that direction is with a lot of training of these chatbots in actual circumstances with actual human conversational uh, examples and that's what the humans will bring to the story sorry about that losing my voice this in general applies to design in general now this article by Matt Shipman talks specifically about feminist design in hiring algorithms and trying to avoid bias and yeah, we, we've covered that. Um, and the idea here is that uh, designers need to be in a process that leads them to consider multiple audiences, uh, both in terms of the people who are doing the hiring and also in the people who are considered as candidates for hiring, even in things like selecting who the algorithm should consider who the algorithm should prioritize for further screening or further interviews. All important questions. But thinking of design generally, these recommendations still apply. Think about the design of a web page. We haven't talked about web page design at all, but there are ways to be more or less inclusive in the, in the creation of a web page and also in the testing. I talked about A-B testing earlier on. Uh, who's doing that testing? Who are the people looking at the two versions of that web page? Uh, how are we ensuring that, well, maybe we're not, but uh, are we ensuring that we're getting a reasonable selection of people and that the people doing the A-B testing are reflecting uh, a broader range of objectives than simply solving a task that the designer has set for them. I know that's how most of these usability uh, exercises work, where you sit somebody down in front of the screen and you tell them, we want you to do such and such a task, and they try to do the task, and you know their, their mouse movements and their time and all of that are measured. Um, there needs also, I think, though, to be room for the, the open-ended sort of assessment where they don't know what they're doing, because that's my general experience, and, and asking ourselves, what are they going to do then? Um, again, our use of AI and analytics in the design process is what's at issue here. How are we shaping our own understanding of design so that it influences and informs how an AI does design. Um, relationships. This is going to be an important one because people are talking, and I'll mention it a little bit a few slides down, about working with AI in teams or collaboratively you know, uh, the, we have the human in the loop, we have the AI in the loop. All of that's based around relationships. Michael Wesch talks about the difference between relationships as understood by his friends in Papua New Guinea and relationships as understood by his students in the United States, where the latter tend to emphasize their independence and individuality, but the former are more connected in much more profound ways, he says. And understanding 
how we construct relationships among ourselves is going to inform in an important way how we instruct, maybe the wrong word there, uh, an artificial intelligence or analytics engine to work in relationship with ourselves. You know, we, we sort of sometimes come up with the idea that when we're working with an AI, that it will be hard-nosed and inflexible. It will reach a conclusion, and once it does, that's it. And that's not how relationships work. We know that. Um, and for an AI to work in a relationship with us, it's going to have to know that. So there needs to be a way of modeling relationships, actual working functional relationships in such a way that an AI can learn how to interact with people as well as to be informed on whatever its area of expertise is going to be. Um, our relationships are in the form of social networks. Uh, they might be very small social networks, you know, the atomic family is a very small social network. Uh, or they might be very large social networks like, you know, the, the community of Taylor Swift fans or Swifties as they're known. Um, what's important here is that we connect to each other. There are various ways we connect to each other. Uh, there are various ways that we as a connected group or network of people learn things develop things and make things, what we might call community knowledge or social knowledge. And, you know, I, and I go back and forth on this quite a bit, and I'm going to do it again, where the things that I say about AI uh, and learning analytics can also be said about social networks. And it's worth asking, how do we learn as humans how to work in social networks, how to be a part of a social network, and even importantly, how to learn from social networks. With respect to ethics specifically, uh, we need to ask, what is the, the ethics of our own communities? We, we could say our own learning community specifically, but you know, it's wider than that. I belong to a community of people who share images online called Imager, or Imager, I don't know how you pronounce it, doesn't matter. Um, and there are some ethical principles that have developed over the years. For example, the no selfies rule. You only show selfies on Christmas day, no other day. Or follow the format of the meme. Um, and there are others. Um, how do those come about? Uh, how do we create them? Um, I've mentioned this before in this course uh, where I had an argument with Jesse Stommel who believes that the way communities create these rules is somebody yells really loud, don't do that, and that's how a rule gets created. Okay, I'm caricaturing his point of view, but not by much, right? Um, I don't think that's it. Uh, I think, you know, there, there may be a role for stating the rule, if there is a rule, but mostly there's a role for modeling the correct behavior, modeling and demonstrating, as, as I've said before. How do we show this in our own communities and make this available in a way that artificial intelligences and analytics engines can understand? Uh, it's an important part of the way we use these systems that when we use them in these environments the way we use them informs how they learn about these environments uh, what would make an ai an ethical partner in a collaboration um i, I mentioned a few moments ago that we have this image of an ai as inflexible and unyielding uh, but here are the sorts of things it needs to be able to do. It needs to be able to enter into an agreement. Uh, this is all uh, from uh, Gary Klein and others. Uh, it needs to be 
predictable in its actions, at least as predictable as I am. Um, it, along with the rest of us, need to be able to take direction. Uh, looking for the AI who can do that. Um, and there's the need to maintain something like a common ground. Now, again, from this point in the course, we can see here that what they're describing is something like a social contract model of team building. It's not clear to me that the best way to work with an AI in a team environment is through a social contract. That might be yielding too much control over to the machine, perhaps, and it might just not be a good way of organizing uh, a team in the first place. Most of the teams that I enter into don't have social contracts. and We, we, we don't enter into an agreement a basic compact or anything like that. A lot of it is just pick up. Uh, you know, we, we learn how to work with each other on the fly. Even teams that are organized around rules, like sports teams, um, where there are predefined roles, the, the way people play those sports and, and fulfill those roles varies from team to team and indeed that's what makes one team different from another is the way they do teamwork together. I went to an Ottawa Senators game recently and I sat there thinking about what is it that I'm looking for in a team that tells me that this team is working well together. And I came up with a list of things. Crisp, sharp passes um, because it shows that people are getting into position, they know what to expect, and that people are executing with trust that the other person will be there. Uh, another principle, winning the battles along the boards. Uh, because those are the hardest parts of the game, winning those battles. And, and you have to actually out-muscle the other team, even if they're stronger than you. Uh, you know, things like that. I, I came up with a list of them. Um, well, these are the sorts of things that it takes a combination of interaction between the players, uh, perhaps a defined environment like a hockey arena, and some coaching. Now, I've never seen that in one of those sports games. Uh, you know, if you play EA hockey, for example, you have you and then a bunch of uh, game controlled teammates. Those teammates are generally pretty bad teammates. <laughs> um, they don't get what you're trying to do with your hockey team. Um, you know, if you're trying for, you know, an attacking style or a defensive game or whatever, right? Uh, sometimes you can actually just toggle a switch, but really they, they should be able to learn from your example and follow the ebb and the flow of the game. That's what I'm talking about. And you might think, well, how do, what does any of this have to do with ethics? has everything to do with ethics because we could, for the sake of argument, represent ethics as uh, how we work together as a team. Um, no, clearly ethics is a broader domain than that. And we're not working in a team with the rest of society, really. But that's only a difference in scale or degree and not a difference in type. And so the sorts of ways we would want an AI to learn about how the humans are playing hockey in the digital hockey game are the sorts of ways that an AI should learn about how a human conducts him or herself in a collaboration or a partnership or in a wider enterprise where a lot of these ethical values and principles come into play. Um, inclusion is a good example of that. Um, again, this is a case of the AI being something other than the hard-edged, inflexible, it makes a decision, that's the end of it, kind of participant. Um, Inclusion is a value in teams, uh, particularly if we want to support the aforementioned principles of bias and representation. 
uh, because simply having diversity isn't going to be enough. People in the team, people who are developing the AI system, people who are using the AI system, all need to be actually actively included in the process. Otherwise, they're just decoration, right? So what does that mean? Well, there's a list here that's kind of provided. Um, and like most such lists, it's informative, but it's also inaccurate, right? Uh, because it's an abstraction. So it's going to miss a lot of the fine details. But look at the sorts of things that it's considering. Empathy, understanding the user's situation, co-creating, uh, collaboration with a multidisciplinary team, learning by trial and error, accepting uncertainties, and then testing and validating things, the experiential component. Being inclusive means including people in all of these things, all of these processes, and actually engaging in some give and take in each of these five dimensions, and then all the gaps in between these five dimensions that the five dimensions don't actually cover. So the sort of AI that we want to work with that will be uh, non-biased and will include diverse perspectives is one that is going to practice inclusion when it is working in a team environment. How, would it, how is it going to learn this? Again, it is going to have to be the people who are working in team environments who model this inclusive kind of behavior for the AI to learn because it's not going to learn it as a set of rules and it's not going to learn it as a set of principles. You know, and that really brings us to the decisions that we make as users, as users of AI, as users of digital media generally. And we really need to question ourselves here. For example, a uh, number of reports have come out. Uh, Mayer or this uh, MIT study by Voshugi and others. We prefer fake news, so it seems. Now, okay, maybe not, but but uh, studies show that we're more likely to share fake news, that we're more likely to read fake news, the the sensational, the controversial. That's why. The algorithms which privilege engagement tend to lead to showing more and more fake news because that's the breadcrumb that draws us along, right? That's the thing that keeps us engaged. So how are we training AI, I might ask, if in our actual practice, we're demonstrating that we prefer fake news? Well, pretty simple example. We're teaching it to give us fake news. That's probably a bad thing. Uh, confirmation bias. Um, you know, we could talk about whether or not confirmation bias is a real thing. Uh, whether the filter bubble is a real thing. The filter bubble is the idea that you select four sources that confirm or echo or reflect your point of view to the exclusion of other points of view. And that's kind of represented in that diagram there. Um, if indeed that is how we are selecting resources to learn from or just to read generally, um, how or what is the impact of that on how an AI learns? Uh, again, we are teaching the AI to feed us only information it knows that we already agree with. And again, arguably, that would be bad. Um, who makes the decisions? And here I'm talking about not, you know, uh, the role of the World Bank or the role of legislators, etc., but just how we in our day-to-day -day lives, our work lives, our home lives, allow people to make decisions. And what we do tend to do is to allow companies to make decisions for us, to allow private companies to make decisions for us. 
Um, and the institutions that we set up privilege those who are in authority um, and, and disenfranchise to a degree um, those who are not in authority. And if you've read my newsletter over, over the years, you've heard my comments about student newspapers at universities. This is a good example of this because uh, in many U.S. institutions especially, uh, these newspapers aren't actually run by students. They're run by administrators who oversee the, the newspapers and actually hold tryouts to see who's allowed to actually be a writer on the newspaper. Very different from the sort of student newspaper that I worked on in Canada where there was no administrative control whatsoever, um, not even by the student's union, where the newspaper itself was run as a collective and it was open to anyone who wanted to participate in the creation and the publication of a student newspaper. It's a very different model. And the way we make and set up these decision-making models, these are the ways we are also training artificial intelligence and analytics engines. And if we train them to defer to authority and to say disenfranchise students, that is the kind of behavior that they will opt to emulate when they are doing their AI kind of thing. And I'm, you know, I'm talking in these broad strokes um, as though we could just train an AI to defer to authority. And that's not actually what happens. We need to be careful to make that clear. Uh, the act of deferring to authority, to pick one out of the various examples I've given, isn't a single thing that we're training AIs to do. Deferring to, a, to authority actually consists of uh, a thousand 10,000 individual decisions that we as individuals make that create this pattern that might overall be characterized or recognized as deferring to authority. And so that is what the actual material is that we're giving to the AI or the analytics engine. And it's important to understand that because we will be able to say in, in all fairness later on, oh, but I never taught the AI to defer to authority or to favor regulatory environments where authorities are privileged. Um, and you haven't, uh, but what you have done is in your own daily life, by exhibiting a pattern of deferring to authority, where each instance of that pattern is what is actually given to the AI, you have taught it to defer to authority. And if you don't like my phrase, defer to authority, insert your own phrase about who makes decisions or how we confirm information or what sort of news that we're going to follow. Insert your own version of that. It, it's all the same. Um, Rules about what matters. Again, another one of these sorts of examples. Uh, here's, here's the sort of thing that happens. Um, Wikipedia is an encyclopedia created by humans. Um, it's used by many uh, AI programs as input data for AI models. Now, Wikipedia a number of years ago, more than a decade, I forget exactly how long ago, uh, in order to ensure that it was viewed as credible, required that everything in it, every assertion of fact in it, was substantiated by a published source. Which sounds like a good idea, but there's a severe and documented lack of media coverage of floods or disasters in underreported regions like say Africa, Patagonia, uh, parts of Southeast Asia, wherever. And so what happens is that over time 
the coverage in Wikipedia begins to be dominated by the same sorts of things that dominate the coverage in traditional media. Well, traditional media has a history, and it's not a good one. And it's, you know, and, and we could go on for quite a while talking about that. Marshall McLuhan, or I'm sorry, Noam Chomsky has certainly talked about the sorts of manipulations that happen in traditional media. Um, and, you know, I've looked at some of the references in Wikimedia. You know, the Daily Express is a published source. The Toronto Sun is a published source. Um, and, and yet, these are what I would argue to be unreliable sources. And yet, uh, if I don't have such a source, and I'm, say, writing about my own work, that's considered unreliable information. Um, so here we have a case where the pre-existing bias to prefer quote-unquote published sources results in a distribution of information that's skewed toward a particular worldview, Western-centered, white-centered, male-centered, power-centered, authority-centered, and then that's reflected in the coverage of Wikipedia, which is then reflected in the models that use Wikipedia as a source of input data. And this informs everything from the, the language that's used, the people that exist, uh, the kinds of facts that are important to be covered. The, whole, the, the basic question uh, that was addressed by Slashdot in the early days, what matters? And so in choosing as a whole what matters, we are, in a very direct way, training our AI and analytics engines of the future. Even the way we build our environment, uh, there's a phenomenon known as stigmergy. Um, and what stigmergy is basically uh, is the way we use objects to communicate with each other. Um, or, or to put it in the words of Verbeek, Artifacts mediate human existence by giving concrete shape to their behavior and the social context of their existence. Uh, you know, the, the, the typical example is the way ants communicate each, with each other by leaving scent trails, for example, or by building caves in certain directions. Uh, there's an example here of people in the, uh, the city of um, Den Bosch in the Netherlands leaving messages to each other in chalk on various things. Um, but it's more than that. It's the way we build our buildings. It's the way we organize our roads. Uh, it's the way we prioritize different kinds of shapes and different kinds of purposes in our architecture. It even boils down to the statues that we have, the monuments that we have, the things that we put plaques remembering on, on the walls. All of these things are part of the overall grist for the AI mill. And you might think, well, that's a bit much, right? Well, think about it. These things all end, well, maybe not all, but the way it's going, they all end up as photographs. The photographs end up in photo sharing sites like Flickr. Photo sharing sites like Flickr are used to train artificial intelligences. Therefore, the shape of the artifacts that we have in the world ends up training AI and analytics engines. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's no way around this. We need these kind of images to train AI. There, there's, a, there's a side discussion we could have here, and I, I touched on it earlier in the discussion on data, about creating artificial data sources to train AI and analytics engines. But ultimately, I think, what we want is to use real examples, real people, real things, real photos, 
But what we need to realize when we're saying that is the decisions that we make as humans end up being the decisions that we make as artificial intelligences. If, for example, the design of all of our cities reflects the belief that cars will be preeminent, we don't need to train an AI with a rule that says cars will be preeminent, but that rule, or some version of it, will be observable in the sorts of decisions it makes because all the different data points that we've given it add up to something like the belief that cars will be preeminent. Uh, so we're training our AIs and I've talked about how the AI would reflect the things that we've said, the decisions that we make, how we use it. And the question can be asked, well, does our ethics work that way? And I argue that that's exactly what happens. Um, of course, we have to, in order to make this kind of point, ask and answer the question, can robots even think like ethical beings? Um, there, the tendency is to kind of treat it like a technical problem. If, if you get the algorithms right, you'll get the ethics right. Or even to think of it as a data problem, right? If we get the data sets right, we'll get the ethics right. Um, one of the contributions of Bostrom and Yudkowsky back in 2011 is the recognition that AI isn't, a or a the ethics of AI isn't a technical problem. Um, and that it, it's not simply a product of ethical engineering. Rather, the wider question is, what constitutes ethical cognition itself? And they say that that should be taken as a subject matter of engineering. Um, I'm not sure what it's a subject matter of. I do know I'm not going to trust engineers to solve the problem for us. I think we need to think more broadly than that, which is why we get back to the points that people make about these design teams needing to be composed of people from a variety of disciplines. But let's pursue this path. Uh, for an AI to even be ethical, we need to be able to say that it understands in some way. There's an awful lot of pushback against that idea, and, and, and fair enough. But still, let's think about it. Um, the early test for whether something actually was an artificial intelligence, whether it understand, uh, was the Turing test. And the Turing test was simply, if you were in a conversation with an AI, could you tell you were talking to a machine rather than to a human? And you might say, well, that's a pretty good test. Uh, but it turns out that machines passed that test a long time ago. Um, like, in the 60s. Uh, even rule-based systems can pass that test. Uh, more recently, uh, Terry Winograd, um, who has kind of a schema-based approach to intelligence generally, uh, offered what he called the schema challenge. And that's where you present an AI with two sentences that change by only one word. Uh, for example, um, pour the water into the bowl until it's full. So what does the word it mean here? Well, we mean bowl, right? As compared to pour the water into the bowl until it's empty. 
well, what does the word it mean? It means whatever we're pouring from. If an AI can understand that difference, then maybe we can say it understands. Well, AI passed that one too. <laughs> uh, GPT-3, which is a recent AI uh, model, uh, was correct on nearly 90% of the sentences, or a few hundred sentences, in a benchmark test. So, uh, I think it was last year, maybe two years ago, they came up with something called uh, Win O' Grande. I don't know, or maybe it's just Win O' Grande, but I'm going to call it Win O' Grande, which is a much larger set of 44,000 such sentences. And right now, by right now, I mean probably about a year ago because there's time lag. Uh, the best programs were getting about 90% of those correct. As compared to humans, which were only getting about 94% correct. At a certain point, you, you begin to wonder, uh, what does it mean for us to say that the AI understands or doesn't understand? Um, and maybe we, we need to redefine what we mean. Uh, Melanie Mitchell wrote recently, she says, the crux of the problem is that understanding language requires understanding the world. And a machine, a machine exposed only to language cannot gain such an understanding. The sort of argument that comes up here is what's called the Chinese room experiment. Um, and uh, was it Searle who proposed that? I think it was John Searle. Uh, I'm just speaking off the top of my mind here. Uh, I'll get the reference right in the actual written version of this. Um, and the idea is that you put a person in a room with a whole bunch of Chinese characters. The person only speaks English, but they have all of these characters and they have a set of rules or, or whatever, right? They might have a neural net, something. Um, such that when somebody feeds them some Chinese characters through the slot, in the door, they look at the characters, they apply the rules, they feed some characters back out. Um, arguably, it doesn't matter what gets fed in and what gets fed out. But let, let's assume that what gets fed out is perfect and always perfect. Um, the person in the room still doesn't understand Chinese. There are various responses to that. For example, you have to consider the whole system of the person plus all the rules and the Chinese characters, etc. All as one thing. And that one thing together does understand. But there's an intuition there, right? Uh, there's an intuition that you need more than just words to understand the world. You need to actually go out and understand the world. Um... There are different ways you can go on this. Here's the way Mel Melanie Mitchell goes. She writes, and I quote, If we want machines to similarly master human language, we will need to first endow them with the primordial principles humans are born with. And to assess machines' understanding, we should start by assessing their grasp of these principles, which one might call infant metaphysics. Uh, it reminds me of what David Hume said, talking about causality and, and connection between cause and effect. Um, that it's something that even though we have no way of figuring out how to use the most advanced reason to make this work, it's something that children, infants, even animals can understand. And my cats understand cause and effect. Uh, they can also tell time. They can also predict when I'm going to feed them and complain when I don't. Um, infants as well exhibit certain senses of knowledge about the world around them. There's, there's certain points where they, they experience object continuity, etc. 
it's not clear to me that they're born with this. Um, there are philosophers, Noam Chomsky is one, Jerry Fodor is another, uh, who suggest that they have all the linguistic categories and skills that they need in born in order to understand language. I don't think that's the case. Um, and the test of that would be, um, you know, if you could give an AI the sorts of experiences that you could give, say, an infant, would the AI learn what the infant is able to learn? And I think that it probably would. The problem, of course, is there would still be people who say, but it doesn't really understand. But at a certain point, we're beginning to beg the question here, what do we mean by understanding, right? If we're saying it's not human, yeah, we get that. But maybe at a certain point, we have to concede that for a rough and ready understanding of what we mean by understanding, as I talked about before in the previous video, we have to accept that we believe that the machine understands. Which brings us to the question of whether the AI can be a moral agent. But it's the same question of whether a person can be a moral agent. So there's two, two aspects of this. First, um, is the AI a moral agent in the sense that it, its autonomy relieves the developer of responsibility? And I think there's a strong negative response to such a statement. I know I respond negatively to it. Um, and Cam says, uh, rights have a significance beyond their role in protecting our interests. Rights reflect our inviolable status as persons. So this question about whether an AI is a moral agent is the question of whether an AI could be considered a person. Um, and we might be more inclined to move on that question than you might think, because we have court cases in recent memory that argue, have decided, that corporate entities are persons. There's actually a name for them, corporate persons. Um, and that they do have some rights. And so it may be the case that an AI has rights, and generally when we talk about rights, we normally associate that as well with responsibilities. And if an AI has rights and responsibilities, then it's a moral agent. Um, the second thing is, how are we going to determine this moral status? Um, and there's, there's two conditions, at least as outlined by Bostrom. One is sentience. Uh, which is the capacity from, for phenomenal experience or qualia, such as the capacity to feel pain and suffer, which seems it would be a cruel thing to give to our AIs. Um, talking about deliberately making someone suffer. But, you know, there is that argument um, in religious philosophy that it's the capacity to suffer that is needed, you know, people ask you, why does God make us suffer? Because that's what we need in order to become moral agents and indeed in order to be free. Um, and then there's the, the other part of it, sapience, which is a set of capacities associated with higher intelligence, such as self-awareness and being a reason responsive agent. In other words, rational. Uh, rationality, I think, the AI has handled. Self-awareness is tougher. But again, it's one of these things, if we treat the AI as, you know, a, a person, that feeds back into the training of the AI. The AI eventually begins to regard itself as a person and treat itself as a person in its own decision-making. So I don't think this is such a hard philosophical conundrum as it might seem. Um, whether or not we ever absolve 
humans a responsibility for AI actions. And I'm not convinced that we should, and that might be a contradiction in my own position. It's going to make sense to us to treat AIs as moral agents in the way we train them and especially the way we use them. And we're going to have to think of them as things that can learn to distinguish right and wrong basically on their own or basically based on the way they've been trained. And, you know, it's, there's a bit of a fuzzy area in between them. And that, I think, leads us to the most important way that we can think of, of how we relate to AI, how we use AI. And that is, we are the teachers of AI. There's no getting around that. Um, it's not like a nuclear reaction where um, once we set the initial uh, subatomic particle moving that everything else is beyond our control. It's not like that. Um, our interaction with artificial intelligence and analytical engines is ongoing um, and dynamic and doesn't end and our major role in these interactions is to train them uh, if we train them well they will become reliable responsible ethical partners that we can work with if we don't train them well then there'll be a problem um, and this is something that belongs to all of us, not just the engineers and the developers. Greg Sattel writing, As pervasive as artificial intelligence is set to become in the near future, the responsibility rests with society as a whole. Put simply, we need to take the standards by which artificial intelligence will operate just as seriously as those that govern how our political systems operate and how our children are educated. That's not encouraging, <laughs> to be honest, um, given the, the somewhat loose and almost slipshod ways in which we've handled both of those things. Um, and given the stakes, maybe we need to take that more seriously, but given the stakes, maybe we need to take political systems and education more seriously as well. But it's the same set of challenges, the same set of responsibilities, the same sorts of outcomes in working with AI as in working with children and then working with trained AI as in working with other people in society. As AI becomes more complex and much more than just a simple set of rules or even a trained model and something that is responding directly to the models and the actions and the examples that we provide then AI is something that we need to for all practical purposes treat as though it were a person and you know, it comes back to what Michael Wesch was talking about 2007, right? The machine is us, and at the same time, the machine is using us. And at a certain point, it becomes really hard to tell the difference. And it's when it becomes really hard to tell the difference that we've actually grasped the significance of the issue and the way forward with respect to understanding ethics, analytics, and the duty of care. That's it for module seven. Next video will be on the final module of the course. I'm Stephen Downs. Thanks for hanging in there with me.